Welcome to Your Brain on Porn. This presentation replaces the original, which was uploaded over four years ago. The material here is current as of March 2015. Let's get a few things out of the way. Number one, I am all for free speech and free will and don't want to ban porn. Number two, I am not religious. Number three, this presentation is not about masturbation or ejaculation. It's about the effects of internet porn. This presentation briefly covers the science behind the other porn experiment. This experiment involves hundreds of thousands of individuals from around the globe eliminating a single variable, which is internet porn. Here are some of the symptoms and conditions that eventually improve or remit. Notice remit in red. Now I'll say this again. These are conditions and symptoms that can heal or significantly improve when porn is removed. First, we have chronic ED, anorgasmia, and delayed ejaculation. Unexplained sexual dysfunctions are the prime motivators for guys to quit. Surprisingly, young guys who grew up using internet porn often need longer to heal their porn-induced ED. Common unexpected benefits include brain fog clearing up and improved concentration. Some diagnosed with ADHD see significant improvements. I want to point out that most of the symptoms I list here often get worse for a bit before they improve. Most had no idea they were lethargic or lacked motivation until they quit using porn and then experienced big increases in energy and motivation. Many start new hobbies, start dating again, or go back to school. Many report social anxiety decreases, often significantly. Others report newfound confidence, which may be the most commonly reported benefit. We have seen even mild to moderate depression fade away. As for emotional numbness, most report that they feel far more emotion or feel more connection to others or colors seem brighter, dreams are more vivid, and creativity surges. Declining interest in real partners can mean loss of libido or you no longer feel that spark in your relationship or you have little motivation to date. When these reverse, libido returns, husbands find their wives very interesting, and real sex starts to feel good again. Finally, the most controversial, escalation to porn that doesn't match original taste or sexual orientation. It's real simple. If a fetish or sexual taste fades away after you quit porn, it's not innate. It was porn induced. I could list many more benefits people have reported, but I'll stop here. Now, how could internet porn use lead to such a diverse collection of symptoms and conditions? The logical answer is that chronic porn use altered the reward circuit, both structurally and chemically. Modern neuroscience and recent brain studies on porn users and internet addicts support this hypothesis. Now, this is a very simple representation of the reward circuit. In this view, we are looking at a slice through the center of the brain. Here's a more accurate representation of the reward circuit. Although it's too complex for our needs, I'm showing this more accurate diagram to emphasize an important concept. When we read or hear about the limbic system or the mammalian brain or the primitive brain, etc., what they are really referring to are a collection of evolutionarily ancient structures. Now, these structures are involved with nearly every mental, emotional, and physical function you can think of. Their job is to keep us alive. Most of these primitive structures are included in what scientists label the reward circuit. Changes in the reward circuit can affect any aspect of behavior and even alter physiological functions. The reward circuit shapes our moods and colors our emotions. Anxiety, euphoria, fear, joy, and rage all arise from these evolutionarily ancient structures. The reward circuit is the seat of most of our desires and drives, whether it's hunger for food, power, or sex. This is where we fall in and out of love and where addiction occurs. In fact, alterations in the reward circuit are behind most mental disorders, whether it's social anxiety, depression, or even schizophrenia. Finally, reward circuit structures such as the hypothalamus and amygdala influence or control major functions such as male sexual behavior, erections, and many aspects of the endocrine system and the autonomic nervous system. 
The bottom line is that chemical or structural changes in the reward circuit can result in wide and varying effects. At its most basic, the reward circuit urges us to seek pleasure and avoid pain. Survival depends on avoidance of pain, physical and emotional, and the repetition of pleasure. To this end, the reward circuit is activated when we engage in behaviors that further our survival or the survival of our genes, such as sex, eating, bonding, achievement, taking risks, play, and, interesting enough, novelty. Reward circuit activation for novelty was meant to make your ancestors inquisitive, so they found new territories, new food sources, and, of course, novel mates. Novelty is what makes the internet so compelling. But there's more. You never make a decision without consulting your reward circuit. Moment to moment, the small yet mighty reward circuit helps you decide what you do like and what you don't like. When the reward circuit is out of balance, as occurs with addiction, your mood, perception, and decision making are all affected. Just want to emphasize this concept. Whether it's hunger, mothering, mating, sexual desire, or addiction, the same reward circuit structures and brain chemicals are performing the same functions in all mammals. Scientists aren't studying rat brains to figure out how to help rats with anxiety disorders, addictions, or erectile dysfunction. Dopamine is one of the major neurochemicals that powers the reward circuit. Think of the reward circuit as the engine that drives our most basic behaviors and dopamine as the gas. Dopamine is the craving neurochemical. Its message is, I've got to have it, whatever it is, whether it's the next potato chip or the next video clip on Pornhub. This experiment demonstrates the power of dopamine. If an electrode is implanted into the reward circuit of a rat, as pictured here, the rat will press the lever over and over until completely exhausted. With the go get it signal soaring with each press, he will ignore willing females, ignore food, and continue to press the lever until he dies of starvation. Artificially activating the reward circuit tricks the rat's brain into believing he's about to accomplish something important, such as eating some cheese or having some sex, but the rat's doing nothing to further his survival. This behavior is not unlike a serious addiction and somewhat similar to surfing the web for just the right porn clip to finish the deed. This is a good place to make an obvious point. Much of today's internet use mimics the lab rat pressing his lever. For the first time in human history, we have an endless stream of novelty available via the internet. So with each click, each swipe, Facebook-like, text message, email, cat video, we receive a little squirt of dopamine. Each squirt of dopamine is interpreted by the brain as something really important, but usually it's not. We are rarely engaged in any activity that furthers our survival or the survival of our genes. On the other hand, when scientists block dopamine, a rat has little motivation to eat, have sex, pretty much do anything. If food is placed in his mouth, he will eat it, but if the rat has to walk over to a bowl of food, he just won't do it. He will starve to death. If presented with a willing female, he does nothing because he has no motivation, no get up and go. Let's bust a myth. Dopamine is not really about pure pleasure or enjoyment. Dopamine equates to wanting, seeking, craving. Dopamine is primarily released in anticipation of something really good, whether it's your favorite dessert or having sex. The final reward, or what we experience as feelings of pleasure, involves the release of opioids. These are heroin and morphine-like chemicals produced in the brain. The biggest blast of opioids occurs at orgasm. A less intense opioid experience is the feeling of satisfaction when eating a great meal. Even the relief of drinking water when you're really thirsty involves opioids. Opioids make us feel satisfied so we stop our seeking and craving. Here's the takeaway. The dopamine system is stronger than the opioid system. We seek more than we are satisfied. Seeking is more likely to keep us alive than sitting around in a satisfied stupor. Dopamine propels animals into action. Some scientists call the reward circuit the seeking circuit. 
Dopamine provides the motivation to pursue our wants and desires. We receive a bigger blast of dopamine and opioids for concentrated sugars and fats because calories meant survival. You thought you were full until the waiter offers you the dessert menu and the anticipation of chocolate mousse sends your dopamine soaring. Dopamine surging in your reward circuit can override your feelings of satiety, regardless of what your rational brain may think about overeating or watching hours of porn. While attaining food is vital, reproduction is your gene's number one priority. Which is why sexual stimulation produces higher dopamine levels than any other natural reward. This graph is comparing reward circuit dopamine levels of food versus sex. High levels of dopamine are one reason why you can tell the difference between a mind-blowing orgasm and chewing on an apple. There are other reasons, as we will see. What about dopamine levels for addictive drugs? Morphine is about the same as sexual stimulation at 200%. Cocaine elevates dopamine more than 300%. Here's the key point. All potentially addictive substances and activities elevate dopamine in the reward circuit. Cocaine, alcohol, nicotine all feel different because they affect other neurotransmitters, but they all flood the reward circuit with dopamine. Drugs simply hijack the circuits and mechanisms that evolve for normal rewards, such as sex. Speaking of sexual stimulation, an internet porn user can keep dopamine levels elevated for hours by clicking from video to video or even searching for porn. That's because novelty, especially sexual novelty, keeps dopamine surging. Here's a quote from a young porn user. I always open several windows in my browser, each one with many tabs. The main thing that arouses me is novelty, new faces, new bodies, new choices. I very rarely even watch the whole porn scene. I can't remember when I saw an entire movie. Too boring. I always wanted new stuff." End quote. For many, the current sexual environment is searching tube sites for hardcore videos. However, the sexual environment for much of human history and our ape ancestors was small tribes occasionally intermingling with other small tribes. Our reward system evolved over eons when potential mates were few and far between. In a hunter-gatherer's lifetime, how many potential sexual partners would he or she even meet? Not too many, I imagine. How many would he or she have sex with? Even fewer. How about the choice of mates available in 2015 with high-speed internet? A porn user today can view more hot babes or hot guys or whatever in one session than our ancestors would meet in several lifetimes. Internet porn's endless stream of sexual novelty is a super normal stimulus because it exploits an ancient biological program, the Coolidge effect. I'll start with rats to illustrate the Coolidge effect at work. What happens when you drop a male rat into a cage with a receptive female rat? First, you see a frenzy of copulation. Progressively, the male tires of female number one. She wants more, but he's had enough of her, and he just can't get excited anymore. However, replace the original female with a fresh one and the male immediately revives and gallantly struggles to fertilize her. You can repeat this process over and over again with fresh females until our male rat is completely wiped out. Another graphic way to view the Coolidge effect, in the top line, a ram needs more and more time to ejaculate with the same old you. But if you keep switching females, the bottom line, he can get the job done in two minutes flat and keep going until he is utterly exhausted. Why are the males losing interest? The rats and rams reward circuits are squirting less and less dopamine with respect to the current female, but produce a big dopamine surge with a new female, thus briefly renewing vigor and sexual desire. This ancient biological program helps to ensure genetic diversity and make sure no female goes unfertilized. But what about humans? As you can see from this Australian experiment, it's not mere nudity, but novelty that sends arousal skyrocketing. Subjects watch 22 porn displays. See that spike? That's where researchers switched to porn the guys hadn't seen before. The result? Subjects' brains and boners sprang to attention again. But aren't humans among the peculiar 3 to 5 percent of mammals capable of monogamy? Happily coupled or not, the Coolidge effect lurks in our primitive brain. 
You might not cheat on your wife or girlfriend, but sexual novelty can send your dopamine surging. Without the Coolidge effect, there would be no internet porn. Maybe we are not so unique. Here's some interesting research. Monkeys just love sweets, like fruit juice. A study found that male monkeys will give up their juice rewards in order to gaze at pictures of female monkey bottoms. That's so 1990s. Who the heck pays for monkey porn anymore? Endless sexual novelty makes internet porn a supernormal stimulus. A supernormal stimulus can be defined as an exaggerated version of a normal stimulus that amplifies qualities we find especially compelling, such as endless sexual novelty at a click. Modern junk food is another prime example of a supernormal stimulus with its never-before-seen combinations of texture, salt, concentrated fats and sugars. So are video games. It was Nobel laureate Nicholas Timbergen who years ago coined the term supernormal stimulus. In evil experiments, Timbergen discovered that birds, butterflies, and other animals could be duped into preferring fake eggs and fake mates. For example, shorebirds would abandon their own smaller eggs to incubate much larger, more colorful plaster eggs fabricated by Timbergen. In this case, size does matter. Another example, male jewel beetles will ignore real mates in favor of copulating with brown beer bottles. To a beetle, a beer bottle lying on the ground looks like the biggest, most beautiful, sexiest female he has ever seen. The male beetles are responding to cues that once offered an evolutionary advantage, but now lead to literal dead ends. Is trying to impregnate a computer screen all that different from copulating with a beer bottle? All the creatures in this slide are simply responding to supernormal versions of sexual cues. As are young men in tech-savvy Japan who now prefer a screen. Quote, in 2010, 36% of men aged 16 to 19 had no interest in sex, double the figure from 2008, end quote. A Japanese medical doctor published a book about this phenomenon called Young People Averse to Sex. He largely blamed internet porn, saying today's internet-oriented society has had a particularly bad effect on young people in this regard. A 2008 French survey found that 20% of young men were not interested in sex. You know something's wrong when the French have no interest in sex. Considering how quickly rates increased in Japan, I wonder what a survey in 2015 would reveal. Besides endless sexual novelty, today's internet porn offers supernormal stimuli via artificially enhanced features such as Viagra sustained penises, exaggerated grunts of desire, pile driving thrust, double penetration, gangbangs, and other unrealistic scenarios. Put simply, internet porn violates our expectations. In normal speak, this means that internet porn delivers more than what we anticipated. Violation of expectations elevates dopamine. Internet porn has even more ways to keep your dopamine soaring than just sexual novelty and violation of expectations. Searching and seeking for more porn keeps dopamine elevated. Remember, the reward circuit is sometimes called the seeking circuit. Anticipation of the next sex act or the next image or next video pumps up your dopamine. Material that shocks or surprises raises dopamine. The I can't believe what I just saw videos, that is. Interestingly enough, porn that causes you anxiety can jack up your dopamine. This is not conjecture as studies show that anxiety can increase sexual arousal. Here's the key point. With high-speed internet, you can control your dopamine with a mouse. That's what makes the internet so unique and compelling. As soon as dopamine starts to drop just a little, you click to a new video or a new genre of porn and up goes your dopamine. You couldn't do this with earlier versions of porn, not magazines, not VHS tapes, not even with the internet before high-speed. Musician John Mayer sums it up. Internet pornography has absolutely changed my generation's expectations. How could you be constantly synthesizing an orgasm based on dozens of shots? You're looking for the one out of a hundred you swear is going to be the one you finish to, and you still don't finish, end quote. But John Mayer was born in 1977. Young guys today describe visiting their favorite tube site, lining up 20 tabs of three minute videos and clicking from video to video with their right hands as they masturbate with their left hands. 
Guys may not finish a three minute video before clicking to a new one. Some watch compilation videos which switch scenes every few seconds. Now unlike photos of naked people, videos completely replace your imagination and limit you to the position of a voyeur rather than a participant. Only with high speed internet and tube sites can you instantly boost your declining dopamine by simply clicking on a video of a completely new genre. If lesbian porn no longer excites you, it's on the girls with goats. If farm animals now bore you, maybe female domination or gang rape will jack up your dopamine. While shock, surprise, and anxiety can all elevate dopamine, intense emotions can also increase stress neurotransmitters and stress hormones. Adding stress neurochemicals into the mix, such as norepinephrine, epinephrine, and cortisol, increases the excitement while amplifying dopamine's already powerful effects. Porn users often escalate to forbidden or shame-inducing genres just to get an extra boost to both dopamine and stress neurochemicals. Over time, a porn user's brain can mistake feelings of anxiety with feelings of sexual arousal. All of this helps explain why some porn users escalate into ever more shocking or anxiety-invoking porn. They need that extra jolt just to become sexually aroused or to orgasm. Here's a very common story. Thing with porn is you need harder and harder material, more taboo, more exciting, and wrong to actually be able to get off. When I stayed away from porn for five months, all those fantasies and urges were gone. My natural sexual taste was vanilla again, and still is." End quote. Not only has the content of porn evolved to be ever more extreme, so has the delivery system. Porn is now omnipresent, free and accessible to every age, at any time, in high definition video. The talking point that today's porn is no different from Greek statues or 1970s Playboy is beyond nonsense. People watch porn on airplanes, at work, in libraries, or on smartphones at school. You can start watching after dinner and surf tube sites until you fall asleep. Some guys deliberately defer ejaculation and maintain a high arousal state for hours, often searching for the perfect scene to finish them off. This is called edging. This also means high dopamine for hours and the brain training that goes with it. Or shock and novelty of internet porn is used to override normal satiation mechanisms, the I'm done feeling. Here's a key point. Addictive drugs and food have limits to consumption, not internet porn. You can watch day in, day out, all day long. So you get it. Internet porn is a dopamine producing machine. The usual question is, what are the possible consequences of all this dopamine? But the more accurate question is, what are the possible consequences of all this dopamine in response to one type of stimulus? In this case, internet porn and a computer screen. The consequences are many, but the following brain changes play a big role in the symptoms and conditions listed earlier. The first major brain change is sexual conditioning. It manifests in two general ways. The first type of sexual conditioning I call, this is how it's done, this is how people have sex, and this is how I should do it. For example, believing that women just love rough anal sex and guys squirting all over their faces. Most research and news articles focus on this type of sexual conditioning, especially in young people. Clearly, years of porn use can shape attitudes and, of course, skew perceptions. Although extremely important, this presentation will focus on a second type of sexual conditioning, which can be summed up as, this is what turns me on. This is a deeper, more ingrained form of learning, especially if one watches internet porn during adolescence. Examples might include, watching porn is more exciting than actual sex, or needing to click from video to video to just to stay sexually aroused or the never-ending list of porn-induced fetishes. The second major group of consequences include addiction-related brain changes, of which there are many. Note that these complex brain changes can be on a spectrum and occur without a full-blown addiction. Here's an important concept we will explore. Both sexual conditioning and addiction share the same key brain change occurring in the same structure which is initiated by the same signal. 
the brain change is called sensitization, but full-blown addiction involves additional brain changes. The structure is the reward center, and the primary signal is, of course, dopamine. Remember this picture of addictive drugs activating the reward pathway or reward circuit? A substance can only cause addiction if it raises dopamine in this one tiny part of the brain called the reward center, where the arrow is pointing. The technical name for the reward center is the nucleus accumbens. Don't confuse reward circuit, which is a whole bunch of interconnected brain structures, with the reward center. Back to the key concept. Both sexual conditioning and addiction are initiated by high dopamine in the reward center. This is a close-up of our simplified version of the reward circuit. The red ball represents the reward center, which is our barometer for wanting or craving something. Sexual stimulation is unique among all natural rewards. Sex activates the same reward center nerve cells as meth, cocaine, and heroin. And that's one reason why these drugs can be so addictive. Other natural rewards, like food, water, salt, etc., activate a different set of nerve cells in the reward center. Here's my graphic representation of this very important concept. Sex activates the part of the reward center in yellow. Other natural rewards activate the region in blue. The green in the middle represents a small overlap between sex and other natural rewards. So what are a few of the takeaways here? First, this dismantles the talking points such as, well, lots of activities raise dopamine, so internet porn is no more addictive than watching sunsets or playing golf. Yeah, that's an actual quote from an academic sexologist. I think you probably know the difference between masturbating to porn and a walk in the park. A major reason you know the difference is that sexual stimulation activates its own special set of reward center nerve cells, the same nerve cells activated by cocaine and meth. Then we add the fact that sexual stimulation produces far higher dopamine and opioid levels than any other natural reward, and we see the silliness of such statements. This dismantles another common talking point. Watching internet porn is no different from playing video games. First, there are no innate circuits for ninja killers, first-person shooters, or stealing cars. On the other hand, many primitive brain circuits and centers are devoted to sexuality, sexual behavior, and reproduction, such as these pictured here. And porn use can alter and shape these circuits, especially during adolescence. Video games aren't real, but young people today are watching real people have real sex during a time when the brain is primed to learn and remember everything about sex. Because we possess innate sexual circuits that will be shaped by the environment, there are no analogies to internet porn, not cocaine or meth or even junk food. Back to the basic concept. Addiction involves several brain changes, but starts with sensitization. Sexual conditioning and sensitization alter the reward center nerve cells in the same way. Both sensitization and sexual conditioning rewire the brain to want it, to crave it, whatever it is. Let's go in depth with sensitization. Using porn as the example, Sensitization occurs when the brain wires together the sights, sounds, smells, sensations, emotions, and memories associated with a big reward, such as masturbating to porn, creating a pathway that can blast our reward center in the future. When activated by cues or triggers, this pathway creates powerful, hard-to-ignore cravings. For example, simply turning on the computer might activate sensitized pathways. So might a sidebar picture on a popular news site. Here are two guys describing sensitization at work. Guy 1. Relapsed to porn once, and even though I didn't get fully erect, I could not believe the intensity of the rush I got when I clicked to the site. Very powerful excitation. Tingling, dry mouth, and even trembling. Guy 2. It's like being possessed by a porn crazed demon, and then once you're finished, your real self returns and wonders what the hell just happened and why you just wasted all this time. End quote. Sensitization is a unique and powerful form of 
Pavlovian conditioning or classical conditioning that alters the reward circuit, both structurally and chemically. Instead of salivating to the sound of the bell, your reward circuit now fires up in anticipation of internet porn. So we know sensitization begins with high levels of dopamine, which tells your primitive brain that this activity is really, really valuable and you should do it again and again. And nothing's more important to your primitive brain than spreading your genes, even if your higher brain knows it's just a screen. Dopamine's ultimate goal is to have us remember and repeat what furthers our gene survival. Dopamine does this by triggering the production of a protein called Delta Fos B. Whether it's drugs or natural rewards, chronically high levels of dopamine can lead to the accumulation of Delta Fos B. This image shows how Delta Fos B accumulates with chronic overconsumption. What's unique about Delta Fos B is that it hangs around in the brain for about eight weeks after your last binge. Delta Fos B activates certain genes that begin to change the brain. As Delta Fos B levels rise, it rewires the brain to want it, whatever it is. This can create a circular process of wanting, leading to doing, and more surges of dopamine, which triggers the production of more Delta Fos B, and the cycle continues. So it's really Delta Fos B that creates sensitization, and it does this by building stronger, more powerful nerve connections. Here's an important point. Long after an addict has quit using and Delta Fos B levels have returned to normal, these sensitized addiction pathways still remain. This explains why alcoholics who have been sober for years can experience strong cravings by simply walking into a pub. Sensitization and other forms of learning are governed by this simple principle. Nerve cells that fire together, wire together. Here's a picture of three nerve cells connected. The top two are communicating and firing together. In this simplified model, the first nerve cell might be your favorite porn star, while the second nerve cell would be in the reward center. Look at where the arrow is pointing. The number of nerve connections is about to increase. There are now more connections, along with chemical changes, that facilitate communication. When a memory or cue activates your favorite porn star nerve cells, your reward center nerve cells are blasted with impulses, which you experience as cravings to watch porn. This mechanism is at work whether it's cues for a gambling addiction or for a cocaine addiction. This process is analogous to walking through a field of grass. The more often you take the path, the easier it becomes. Eventually, porn can become the path of least resistance or even the preferred pathway for both sexual arousal and entertainment. Forming new brain pathways falls under the umbrella term neuroplasticity. This is how we learn and how we become addicted. Another form of neuroplasticity involves weakening of old brain pathways. Examples include forgetting most everything you learned in high school and breaking a bad habit. Sometimes we lump these two together and just simply call it rewiring the brain. Neuroplasticity refers to the brain's ability to change and adapt as a result of experience. Neuro is for neuron or nerve cell, and plasticity means plastic in the sense of malleable, changeable, adaptable. Here is the book on neuroplasticity, the number one bestseller, The Brain That Changes Itself, by psychiatrist Norman Doidge. He treated a lot of men with porn-induced ED and porn-induced fetishes. Quote from the book, The current porn epidemic gives a graphic demonstration that sexual taste can be acquired. Pornography, delivered by high-speed internet connections, satisfies every one of the prerequisites for neuroplastic change. Describing his patients, Doidge continues, the men at their computers looking at porn were uncannily like the rats in the cages at the NIH, pressing the bar to get a shot of dopamine or its equivalent. Though they didn't know it, they'd been seduced into pornographic training sessions that met all the conditions required for plastic change of brain maps." End quote. But Norman Doidge was treating older men who had years of real sex before the internet came along. The adolescent brain is far more plastic than an adult's brain, and it is primed to wire up to sexual cues in order to successfully reproduce later on. 
Before the internet, what would a 13-year-old boy fantasize about when masturbating? Maybe making out with a girl in his class? If it was the 70s, maybe feeling up Farrah Fawcett, all age appropriate. Today, a 13-year-old's imagination is replaced by hardcore streaming videos of people engaged in all sorts of crazy stuff. None of it is age appropriate and little of it resembles real sexual encounters. Let's visualize the fire together, wire together principle at work in a 13 year old boy just discovering tube sites. Adding internet porn into the mix creates two competing sexual pathways, porn in yellow and real in white. Sure, Jessica in algebra is cute, but if a 13 year old is masturbating every day to gang bangs, cream pies, or hente, the Jessica pathways will have a hard time keeping up. Here's why. He's not masturbating to thoughts of Jessica, but to porn. His brain is constantly reinforcing the stimuli he associates with masturbation and ejaculation. The sensitized porn pathway is now the preferred pathway because it leads to a bigger reward than the real pathway. The white line representing real people is dotted because disuse can weaken it. Norman Doidge summarizes. Because plasticity is competitive, the brain maps for new, exciting images increased at the expense of what had previously attracted them." End quote. Whether we call it brain maps, or sensitized porn pathways, or sexual conditioning, or this is what turns me on, it all comes down to training the brain to expect sexual arousal under specific conditions. With internet porn, these conditions include being alone, sitting in a chair, voyeurism rather than participation, continuously searching and seeking for the next hit of dopamine, constant novelty with each click, multiple tabs each with a three minute video, shock and surprise to maintain arousal, new genres to overcome boredom, multiple porn stars per session or per video, fetishes of every imaginable and unimaginable type. While this type of sexual conditioning is far more powerful during adolescence, it can occur at any age. So whether you are 22 or 52, the disparity between real sex and masturbating to internet porn is a major factor in both porn-induced erectile dysfunction and other sexual problems and the inability to quit using porn. Sensitized porn pathways light up for one type of experience, yet real sex is a completely different kind of experience. Many with porn-induced fetishes or porn-induced ED need to not only stop using porn, they also need to rewire their sexual arousal to real partners. To summarize, both sensitization and sexual conditioning appear to involve the same reward center changes with Delta Fos B playing a major role. The name of the study, Natural and Drug Rewards Act on Common Neuroplasticity Mechanisms with Delta Fos B as a Key Mediator. 2013, the natural reward here is sex. Quote from the study, Natural and drug rewards not only converge on the same neural pathway, they converge on the same molecular mediators and likely the same nerve cells to influence the wanting of both types of rewards. End quote. This means that cravings for addictive drugs or for porn tap into the same mechanisms and brain circuits. And recent brain studies on porn addicts support this. Feel free to read the titles. These two studies were by addiction neuroscientists at Cambridge University. Both studies compared carefully screened porn addicts to control groups and found sensitization in the porn addicts. Compare the two rows. The porn addicts reward centers lit up when exposed to porn, far more than normal healthy controls and as the headline says, just like the brains of drug addicts do when they are exposed to drug related cues and triggers. Another headline. Anyhow, the Cambridge studies found even more similarities with drug addiction. Quote, sexual desire or subjective measures of wanting appear disassociated from liking in line with incentive salience theories of addiction in which there exists enhanced wanting but not liking of salient rewards. Translation, porn addicted subjects aligned with the accepted model of addiction called incentive sensitization. That is, they experienced strong wanting and cravings to use porn, yet they did not like it any more than non-addicts, or, as some would say, wanting it more, 
liking it less, yet never really satisfied. Another quote from one of the studies, porn addicted subjects reported that as a result of excessive use of sexually explicit materials, they experienced diminished libido or erectile function specifically in physical relationships with women, although not in relationship to the sexually explicit material." End quote. Not only did their brains look like drug addicts, but 60% of the subjects, average age 25, had porn-induced erectile dysfunction or porn-induced low libido. This completely dismantles the claim that compulsive porn users simply have higher sexual desire rather than an addiction. If you can get a boner for porn, but not for real flesh and blood partners, you don't have high libido. Up till now, we've been exploring the shared mechanisms behind sensitization and sexual conditioning. However, you can condition your sexual arousal to internet porn, uh, experience porn-induced sexual problems, or porn-induced fetishes, and yet not be addicted. We are seeing this more and more. As mentioned, addiction involves many more brain changes than just sensitization. Before we examine those brain changes, let's look at a simple assessment for addiction. The four C's is a simple screening test for addiction. The first C is continued use in spite of negative consequences. This is the core behavior identifying an addiction. What makes porn different is that most porn users had no idea porn was causing negative consequences until they gave it up. The second C is compulsion to use. For example, thinking about porn when you're not using or eagerly anticipating watching porn. The third C is the inability to control use. Now this is pretty straightforward. You try to stop and you can't, another major sign of addiction. The last C is craving, either psychological or physical. Craving involves sensitization and can be triggered by external cues, such as being home alone or seeing a pop-up, or triggered by internal things, such as stress, anxiety, or just plain boredom. Finally, withdrawal symptoms are not necessary for addiction. Some porn users experience few, if any, withdrawal symptoms. Others are quite surprised by the severity of the withdrawal symptoms, such as anxiety, restlessness, irritability, insomnia, fatigue, poor concentration, depression, mood swings, social isolation, headaches, and many, many more. The last on the list is unique to porn users. Some, but not all, experience a severe loss of libido called the flat line, which can last from weeks to months. The flat line may also involve temporary erectile dysfunction or a lifeless penis. The fact that addictions share similar withdrawal symptoms is more evidence that all addictions share certain fundamental brain changes. Let's look at four major categories of brain changes caused by addiction. We have already examined sensitization, which is hyperreactivity to cues and overwhelming cravings to use. The second brain change is desensitization. I call this a numbed pleasure response. This involves a decline in feel-good neurochemicals such as dopamine and opioids and their receptors. Desensitization is behind tolerance, which is the need for higher and higher levels of stimulation just to get a buzz. The third brain change is hypofrontality. This manifests as reduced willpower and poor impulse control and is caused by inhibited frontal lobes. The fourth brain change involves an altered stress response. Even minor stressors lead to cravings and relapse because they activate powerful sensitized pathways. I'll first compare and contrast sensitization with desensitization. Here's one way to visualize sensitization and desensitization. On the left, we have sensitization or the addiction. Any cues associated with the addiction blast the reward circuit with dopamine and other neurochemicals. On the right, desensitization is represented. Everything except the addiction is far less exciting than it used to be. Socializing, sports, movies, eating, even sex. A principal driver of addiction is this imbalance between the overpowering cravings to use caused by sensitization and experiencing less pleasure with everyday activities caused by desensitization. Desensitization involves chronically low dopamine signaling and perhaps low opioid signaling. 
This reward deficiency or numb pleasure response urges the person to seek out dopamine racing activities. Unfortunately, sensitized pathways related to your addiction provide the most reliable source of neurochemical relief. Desensitization manifests as tolerance, which is defined as needing a higher dose or more stimulation to achieve the same effect. You might spend more time online searching, extend your sessions, watch when not masturbating, maybe search for the perfect video to end with. For some porn users, tolerance manifests as escalating to new genres, sometimes harder core, stranger, or even disturbing. Remember, shock, surprise, and anxiety can elevate slumping dopamine. Here's one man's experience. When I got internet back in my late teens, I found many YouTube-like porn sites that categorize content by fetishes. At first, my taste in porn was that of a normal teenage boy, but taking a closer look, over the years, I noticed my taste in porn have shifted into more aggressive content, violent themes against women to be more specific, especially those anime hentai videos with scenarios that were too vile to be portrayed in real life. Eventually, though, I got bored of that stuff, and when I entered my 20s, I found new stuff, but what's interesting is that my taste in porn changed more and more frequently, so that within a year I had acquired many new fetishes, each changing in a shorter time frame than the one before it." End quote. To understand desensitization, we need to see how individual nerve cells communicate. The dopamine-producing nerve cells affected by desensitization originate from the beginning of the reward circuit and make connections with other nerve cells in the reward center. Remember this picture? Nerve cells communicate where the purple branch-like projections almost touch. Instead of electricity, nerve cells send messages using chemical messengers such as dopamine. With this picture in mind, let's look at a close-up of one connection or synapse between two reward circuit nerve cells. Notice there is a gap. The nerve cell on the left sends its message by releasing dopamine into the space. Dopamine speeds across the gap into the receptors on the receiving nerve cell to the right. Think of receptors as little ears that hear the message. The strength of dopamine's message is dependent on the number of connections, the amount of dopamine released, and the number of receptors to hear the message. A decline in any one of these three leads to a weaker message. All three can decline with desensitization. With binging and dopamine constantly blasting the reward circuit, the nerve cells say, enough is enough. If someone screams at you, you cover your ears. Nerve cells do this by removing dopamine receptors and reducing the amount of dopamine released, the bottom picture. Less dopamine released or fewer receptors activated means weaker signals, and this translates into less excitement and less satisfaction. It's like your eight-cylinder engine is now running on two cylinders. The same desensitization process may occur with other reward neurochemicals such as opioids or endocannabinoids. Over time, desensitization could involve a more observable structural change, which is a decline in the number of nerve connections or synapses. The branch-like parts of the nerve cells simply fade away. Since the branch-like nerve connections appear gray, this is referred to as the loss of gray matter. In this picture, the gray matter is colored purple. Look at where the red arrow is pointing. It's about to change. This loss of gray matter means fewer connections, and fewer nerve connections also means fewer dopamine receptors, less dopamine, and the need for greater stimulation to activate the reward center. This is exactly what a 2014 brain study on porn users found. The name of the study is Brain Structure and Functional Connectivity Associated with Pornography Consumption, The Brain on Porn. It was done by top neuroscientists at the prestigious Max Planck Institute. Unlike the Cambridge studies, the subjects in this study were not porn addicts and were not asked about sexual problems. Instead of comparing porn addicts to non-addicts, the study correlated the amount of porn used with changes in brain structures and how the reward circuit responded to sexual images. 
The first finding was higher hours per week and more years of porn viewing correlated with a reduction in gray matter in parts of the reward circuit. This occurs with desensitization. Lead author Simone Kuhn said that could mean that regular consumption of pornography more or less wears out your reward system. Researchers also found that more porn use correlated with lower brain activation while viewing sexual images. Said the study, this is in line with the hypothesis that intense exposure to pornographic stimuli results in a downregulation of the natural neural response to sexual stimuli. End quote. Put simply, more porn use leads to desensitization. Lead author Simone Kuhn continued, We assume that subjects with high porn consumption need increasing stimulation to receive the same amount of reward. Kuhn says existing psychological scientific literature suggests consumers of porn will seek material with novel and more extreme sex games. That would fit perfectly the hypothesis that the reward systems need growing stimulation, end quote. Again, these brain changes occurred in men who were not addicted to porn, and so did the next brain change. This same Max Planck study also found evidence for hypofrontality, which is the third major brain change caused by addiction. Hypo means below normal or deficient, and frontal refers to the frontal lobes or prefrontal cortex. With hypofrontality, the frontal lobes undergo chemical and structural changes. This leads to weakened willpower and a very hard time controlling porn use. The Max Planck study found that the nerve connections between the reward circuit and the prefrontal cortex worsened with increased porn watching. As the study explained, dysfunction of this circuit has been related to inappropriate behavioral choices such as drug seeking regardless of the potential negative outcome. Compared to other primates, humans possess well-developed frontal lobes. Larger, more intricate frontal lobes give us humans much of our intelligence and problem-solving ability. The frontal lobes are involved in many complex functions, such as abstract thought, planning ahead, and reflection. Important to this presentation, the frontal lobes govern willpower and impulse control. Our frontal lobes comprehend the consequences of our actions and try to inhibit impulses that we might later regret, such as punching our annoying boss, or screaming at our kids, or binging on porn until 2 a.m. in the morning the night before an exam. One of the main benefits of meditation is to strengthen the frontal lobes, somewhat like strengthening a muscle. Meditation is one of the primary tools suggested for those trying to give up porn. A delicate balance exists between the more primitive urges and desires arising from our reward circuit and our values and long-term goals arising from our more rational frontal lobes. We can visualize this using our usual picture. Our very busy brain is continually bombarding our reward circuit with a stream of sights, sounds, smells, sensations, thoughts, and memories. Although simplified, the go-for-it messages that can hijack the reward circuit are generally inhibited by the think-about messages from the frontal lobes. For example, a bag of potato chips after dinner seems like a great idea to your survival conscious reward circuit, but seems like a terrible idea to the image and health conscious frontal lobes. The thought of masturbation to porn seems like a great idea to your reward circuit, but your frontal cortex reminds you that you have porn-induced ED and a not-so-happy partner. With addiction, the balance of power shifts. The dotted white line represents hypofrontality. Like an unused muscle, the think about it self-control systems have physically weakened. Cravings emanating from sensitized porn pathways in yellow can overwhelm your weakened willpower, making cues and triggers very difficult to resist. The following is an example of hypofrontality in action. When I got a computer, I found myself more and more looking at porn, although at the same time, I hated it and frankly found it really boring. I can honestly say that porn has been the single most destructive element of my life, reaching into every aspect including my marriage and my career. I am desperate to end it. We have looked at sensitization, desensitization, and hypofrontality. The last major brain change on our list is an altered or dysfunctional stress response. 
Addiction leads to very complex changes in the brain's stress circuits and perhaps circulating hormones. Effects of addiction include, number one, even minor stress activates sensitized addiction pathways, which pound the reward circuit, causing hard to ignore cravings. Number two, withdrawal from addiction, such as porn addiction, activates the brain's stress systems. An overactive stress system is behind many of the withdrawal symptoms, such as anxiety, fatigue, mood swings, and insomnia. Remember the balance of power we normally maintain? Stress clobbers the addict with a double whammy. Stress not only activates sensitized addiction pathways leading to cravings, stress also inhibits the frontal lobes, our seat of willpower and impulse control. This is why most relapses can be traced to stressful events or simply negative thoughts. And it's why stress-reducing strategies such as meditation, exercise, and socializing are so helpful. Here again are the four major addiction-related brain changes. Let's imagine that each brain change could actually speak. Desensitization would be moaning, I can't get no satisfaction. At the same time, sensitization would be poking you in the ribs and saying, hey buddy, I've got just what you need, which happens to be the very thing that caused the desensitization. Hypofrontality would be shrugging and sighing, I know this is a really bad idea, but I just can't stop you. And finally, dysfunctional stress circuits would be screaming, I need something now to take the edge off. Although hundreds of internet addiction studies exist, only four brain studies have been published isolating internet porn use from other types of internet applications. All four studies reported the same fundamental brain changes as seen in drug addicts. They also report porn-induced erectile dysfunction, porn-induced low libido, lower brain activation to sexy pictures, etc. You can pause the video and read the list. I said studies isolating porn use as a separate internet application because there are now over 100 internet addiction brain studies. You can see the growing list at this link. Some of the brain studies involve general internet use, which of course includes porn use. Other studies just investigated gaming or social media. Without exception, all 100 studies reported brain changes consistent with other addictions, including drug addiction. In case you're wondering, there is massive and overwhelming evidence for the existence of behavioral addictions. For example, hundreds of recent animal and human studies show that overconsumption of junk food can lead to many of the same fundamental brain changes as seen in drug addiction. And gambling addiction has long been recognized even by the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. The DSM is often called the Bible of Psychiatry, but it's really just a laundry list for insurance reimbursement. Anyhow, the highly political and very slow to change DSM has finally created a new behavioral addiction category in the recently published DSM-5. Two years before the DSM-5, the American Society of Addiction Medicine released its sweeping new definition of addiction. Based on decades of human and animal research, ASAM confidently declared that addiction is one condition, whether it's alcohol, cocaine, gambling, or sex. That means that the signs, symptoms, and behaviors of an addiction reflect the constellation of underlying brain changes, such as sensitization, desensitization, hypofrontality, and dysfunctional stress circuits, among others. ASAM emphasizes that addiction is a primary illness or condition. In other words, it's not caused by mental health issues such as mood or personality disorders. This refutes the popular notion that addictive behaviors are simply a form of self-medication to, say, ease the pain of depression or anxiety. This is exactly what we have observed over the years, that a large percentage of young men addicted to porn have no pre-existing conditions such as depression or OCD nor did they have childhood trauma. They were just young guys who liked porn and thought watching it was the normal thing to do, which it is. Here's a commonly asked question. How great is the risk for porn addiction? Well, except for cigarettes, only about 10 to 15 percent of drug and alcohol users ever become addicted. This is also true for rats. But here's an important point. 
the reward circuit did not evolve to urge us to seek drugs or alcohol. The reward circuit evolved to urge us to seek food, sex, love, and other natural rewards. Which is why supernormal versions of these natural rewards have the potential to hook more of us, or at the very least desensitize us to normal everyday pleasures. Let's take junk food. First thing is that several studies have shown that rats prefer sugary and fatty foods to addictive drugs, as most humans do. Second, experiments show that animals rapidly gain weight when provided a variety of enticing foods. When rats are given unlimited access to what's called cafeteria food, almost 100% of them binge to obesity. Today, 35% of adult Americans are obese and 70% are overweight. Junk food urges our primitive brain to binge to override our normal satiation mechanisms. Finally, when both rats and humans binge to obesity, their brains change in ways that mimic drug addiction. But today's internet porn is not really like addictive drugs or junk food. First, today's porn is free and private, easy to access, available 24-7, and no one can tell you are using. Unlike food and drugs, there are no physical limitations to internet porn consumption. The brain's natural satiation mechanisms are not activated unless one climaxes. Even then, the user can click to something more exciting to become aroused again. With food and drugs, one can only escalate by consuming more. With internet porn, one can escalate both with more novel partners and by viewing new and unusual genres. Unlike food or addictive drugs, internet porn is always available in your brain waiting to be replayed. You can activate your sensitized addiction pathways and receive a jolt of dopamine just by daydreaming. Number five really sets porn apart. As internet porn can shape and mold our innate sexual circuits, drugs, alcohol, junk food, or video games can't do that. So what about the rates of internet porn addiction? Well, it's hard to know how many people are addicted or negatively affected by internet porn, given the privacy that surrounds its use and the fact that users rarely connect porn use with their symptoms. However, a 2014 survey of 1,000 U.S. adults found that 33% of men 18 to 30 either thought they were addicted to porn or weren't quite sure. In sharp contrast, only 5% of men 50 to 68 thought they could be addicted. Here's a headline from just last week. 10% of 12 to 13 year olds fear they are addicted to internet porn. Think about that. Twice as many 12 year olds as middle aged men think they are addicted to porn. It's clear that addiction related brain changes can account for these and many other porn induced symptoms and conditions. However, one can develop porn-induced symptoms without developing a full-blown porn addiction. This is supported by countless anecdotes and by the Max Planck study we looked at er earlier, where porn use in non-addicts was correlated with less reward circuit gray matter and weaker brain response to sexual images. What do you do if you think porn use may be causing you problems? Well, if you are truly addicted to porn, you may need to change your life on many different levels. I suggest looking under the support tab on yourbrainonporn.com for all sorts of websites, recovery programs, and organizations. Whatever your approach, the primary suggestion is to unplug and give your brain a rest from all artificial sexual stimulation. Giving your brain a rest from all artificial sexual stimulation is called a reboot. You may ask, but what about, well, if you have to ask, the answer is no. Artificial sexual stimulation includes anything your brain might use in a way it has been using porn. This means no porn substitutes. This list is not complete. Surfing Facebook, YouTube, or dating sites for images is like an alcoholic switching to light beer. Counterproductive. You need to step away from the screen, Stop clicking to get your dopamine hits and stop training your brain to be a voyeur rather than a participant. The goal now is to seek your pleasure from interacting with real people without a screen in the way. One more thing, it's not a problem if you accidentally bump into porn. The problem is when you actively seek it out and search for it, thus reactivating sensitized porn pathways. What about recovery from porn-induced sexual problems such as ED, delayed ejaculation, or fetishes? Same advice, 
you need to stop activating the sensitized porn pathways, start building or nurturing the real person pathways. In other words, you need to train your brain for the right sporting event, which is reality. Eventually, the porn pathways will weaken, desensitization will eventually be reversed, and your real person pathways will grow stronger. If you have porn-induced sexual problems, your goal is to obtain your sexual arousal from reality, like your ancestors did before the internet. What a concept. What about masturbation or orgasm during a reboot? Well, some rebooters temporarily eliminate or drastically reduce masturbation, especially if they have porn-induced sexual problems. This is a one-person experiment. You need to be adaptable and flexible. That's really my main suggestion. If and when you masturbate, do so without porn or recalling porn. Guys suggest focusing on sensations. The reboot metaphor isn't perfect. You can't go back in time to a restore point or erase all the data as you would when you wipe clean a computer's hard drive. However, the brain is very plastic and you can reverse many of the psychological effects and the brain changes brought about by porn use. For example, with time, you can restore the sensitivity of your brain's reward circuitry and experience more pleasure in everyday activities. This occurs as dopamine, opioids, and other reward neurochemicals and their receptors return to baseline. Hypofrontality, which leads to weakened willpower, can also be reversed. Now, this takes both time and engaging your frontal lobes to make better choices. As the frontal lobes strengthen, urges will be easier to ignore, and healthy choices such as exercise and socializing will become far more appealing. What about the sensitized porn pathways that are behind cravings to use and relapses? Well, there's good news and there's bad news. First, the good news. Remember the neuroplasticity principle behind sensitization? That nerve cells that fire together, wire together. Fortunately, we have an opposing principle, which goes by the saying, when nerve cells fire apart, wires depart. Looking at the red arrow, we can visualize this as a weakening of nerve connections, although other changes occur too. Think about this as unlearning or use it or lose it. The goal, of course, is to lose the sensitized porn pathways represented in yellow. And that's what happens. With time and neglect, the sensitized porn pathways will weaken and fade as represented by the dotted yellow line. Here's the bad news. The sensitized porn pathways may fade and weaken, but they will probably always remain, waiting to be revived. As described earlier, even after years of sobriety, reactivating sensitized addiction pathways can lead back to the inability to control use. More bad news. When an addict quits using, the sensitized addiction pathways temporarily grow stronger and more sensitive to addiction cues and triggers. This is a drawing of reward center nerve cells. Compare left to right. On the right side, we see more branches and more nerve connections. Chronic drug use followed by abstinence cause these nerve cells to sprout more branches called dendrites and to form more connections called synapse. Instead of absence making the heart grow fonder, it's abstinence that makes the reward center grow more sensitive. Studies show that these extra connections sprout by at least day seven of abstinence and are pretty much gone by about four weeks, though other types of changes stick around longer. Just a reminder, these are the type of nerve connections we are talking about. These extra synapses are a big reason why cravings can be stronger a week or two after quitting. It's like your reward center has produced a bunch of extra hands to grab whatever you are addicted to. Because it takes four weeks for these extra connections to fade, long streaks of not using can be really beneficial. Now, why in the world would the brain make it so much more difficult to stop an addiction? Obviously, this mechanism did not evolve to keep us addicted. Instead, sprouting extra connections evolved to urge mammals to repeat natural rewards, such as sex. This is just another example of addictive drugs hijacking a mechanism in place for reproduction. Real simple. If you haven't copulated in a while, your genes make sure you become extremely sensitive to and easily aroused by sexual cues in your environment. This mechanism evolved to keep us doing the deed, not to keep us addicted to drugs. 
For many, rebooting is not a linear process. That is, each day isn't better than the last. Here's a mood graph created by a rebooter with porn-induced ED. You can see the emotional ups and downs, although the trend over time is upward. Neurochemically induced mood swings can continue for quite a while. Another rebooter made this, the title, Think of Recovery as a Scatter Plot. Everyone's experience is somewhat different. Don't compare yourself to others. This quote sums it up. It's amazing what you learn doing this. I now fully understand the saying that knowledge is power. Once you know how something works and how it affects you, it's much easier to muster the willpower to make a change." End quote. Visit YourBrainOnPorn.com for more information on everything associated with rebooting and links to forums and many other helpful websites. You can also read my new book, Your Brain on Porn, Internet Pornography and the Emerging Science of Addiction, which is a good synopsis of the info on the website.